Euclidean geometry is the geometry we learn in high school with its familiar straight lines, circles and triangles. It's the geometry of the plane and was fully described around 300 BC by Euclid in his monumental book Elements. Euclid starts out by listing five axioms or self-evident truths together with five postulates or additional assumptions. The last of these postulates has always been a bit of an oddball. One way to state it is that given any straight line and any point not on it, we can draw through that point one and only one straight line parallel to the given line. On the face of it, that seems common sense and obvious, but there'd always been a lingering doubt about whether the properties of parallel lines as presupposed in Euclidean geometry could be derived from the other postulates and axioms, or whether the parallel postulate had to be assumed as an extra fact. In the early 1800s, three mathematicians working independently found good reason for this doubt. Remarkably, they discovered geometric systems that satisfy all the axioms and postulates of Euclidean geometry, except the parallel postulate. These geometries show not only that the parallel postulate must be assumed in order to obtain Euclidean geometry, but more importantly that other geometries, non-Euclidean geometries, can and do exist. The first to hint that there were geometric realms undreamt of by Euclid was Carl Gauss, German mathematician, astronomer and physicist. Gauss argued that the geometry of the space we live in can't simply be assumed to be Euclidean. Its nature must be determined by measurement and experiment. And this is exactly what he did. Commissioned by the government in 1827 to make a survey map of the region for miles around Göttingen, Gauss found that the sum of the angles in his largest survey triangle was different from the expected Euclidean 180 degrees. The observed deviation around 15 arc seconds was both inescapable evidence for and a measure of the curvature of Earth's surface. It was also the first concrete proof of a world that lay beyond Euclid. Gauss had many brilliant ideas that he didn't publish, and his pioneering thoughts on non-Euclidean geometry were among them. Only many years later, after his death in 1855, did the diary come to light in which Gauss had written down his manifesto for a non-Euclidean revolution. The first mathematician actually to go to press with his views on the subject was the Russian Nikolai Lobachevsky in 1826. He describes a geometry in which Euclid's parallel postulate isn't obeyed and in which the sum of the angles of a triangle add up to less than 180 degrees, a kind of geometry said to be hyperbolic, and the sort found on the surface of a saddle. Unbeknownst to him, a young Hungarian mathematician, Janos Bolyai, had made the same startling breakthrough a few years earlier. None of these contributions to exploring the non-Euclidean landscape had much impact on mathematics in the first half of the 19th century. Yet their time was coming. In 1853, when Gauss was 76, his star pupil Bernard Riemann had to give a lecture at the University of Göttingen to confirm his position as a faculty member. It was the tradition in such circumstances to offer three possible topics, but that the choice would be made between only the first two. Not surprisingly, given this normal course of events, Riemann hadn't fully prepared for his third choice, the foundations of geometry. Gauss, however, couldn't resist the prospect of hearing his wunderkind speak on a subject that he, Gauss, had grappled with for much of his life, and so he asked Riemann to deliver this third topic. After several postponements, Riemann gave his lecture on the hypotheses which lie at the foundations of geometry in June 1854. It proved to be a triumph and marked a turning point in our understanding of non-Euclidean math. Earlier in his career, Gauss had published results in which he hugely advanced the theory of surfaces in two dimensions. He'd shown that it isn't necessary to consider a two-dimensional surface 
such as a sphere, to be embedded in a three-dimensional space in order to define its geometry. It's enough to consider measurements made entirely within that two-dimensional geometry, such as an intelligent ant might make that was forever restricted to live on its surface. The ant would know that the surface was curved by measuring that the sum of the internal angles of a large triangle differs from 180 degrees, as Gauss had done during his geodetic survey, or by measuring that the ratio between a large circumference and its radius differs from 2 pi. As a result of his study of surfaces, Gauss gave a precise mathematical meaning to the idea of curvature, and a way of evaluating it. So-called Gaussian curvature is positive on the surface of a sphere, negative at every point on a saddle-shaped surface such as a hyperboloid, and zero for a plane. It thus determines whether a surface has elliptic or hyperbolic geometry. But Gauss didn't confine his thinking to a curved two-dimensional surface floating in a flat three-dimensional universe. In a letter to Ferdinand Schweikart in 1824, he dared to conceive that space itself is curved. This brilliant inspiration was to take root in the mind of Gauss's most talented apprentice. Riemann extended Gauss's work to spaces of any number of dimensions and put on a firm footing the type of non-Euclidean geometry that Gauss had hinted at, the kind known as elliptic geometry, in which there are no parallel lines and in which the angles of a triangle always add up to more than 180 degrees. He also generalized the notion of the shortest distance between two points. In Euclidean geometry, this is simply a straight line, but step out of Euclid's domain and the quickest way to get from A to B involves a change of tack. The easiest way to grasp this idea is to think about travelling on the Earth's surface, which isn't flat but roughly spherical, a special case of Riemann's elliptic geometry. To take a ship on the shortest route between two ports, you sail, wherever possible, along an arc of a great circle, the circle that goes all the way around the Earth and on which both ports lie. Any such minimum length path on a surface, the special case of which on a plane is a straight line, is called a geodesic. In Euclidean geometry, the shortest distance between two points can be found using Pythagoras' theorem. What Riemann discovered was a more powerful general form of Pythagoras' theorem that works on curved surfaces, even when the curvature is in more than two dimensions and varies from one place to another. In this looking-glass world of curved space, the familiar idea of distance is replaced by the broader concept of something called a metric, from the Greek for measure, while curvature is similarly described by a more elaborate mathematical object. Gauss had found that the curvature in the neighbourhood of a point of a specified two-dimensional geometry is given by a single number, the Gaussian curvature. Riemann showed that six numbers are needed to describe the curvature of a three-dimensional space at a given point, and that twenty numbers at each point are required for a four-dimensional geometry, the twenty independent components of the so-called Riemann curvature tensor. In his famous lecture of 1854, Riemann emphasised, as Gauss had done, that the truth about the space we live in can't be found by poring over 2,000-year-old books of Greek geometry. It has to come from physical experience. He pointed out that space could be highly irregular at very small distances and yet appear smooth on an everyday level. At very great distances, he also noted, a large-scale curvature of space might show up perhaps even bending the universe into a closed system, like a gigantic ball. So far ahead of his time was Riemann that having arrived at his great mathematical description of space curvature, he began working on a unified theory of electromagnetism and gravitation in terms of it. Riemann grasped that forces might be nothing more nor less than a manifestation of the geometry of space flat beings on a wrinkly two-dimensional landscape like that of a 
crumpled sheet of paper, would, when they tried to move around, experience what felt to them like gravitational effects. By analogy, he reasoned, forces in our world might best be explained in terms of warps in a higher dimension, and the effect would work both ways. If space told mass how to move, then space must itself, by the principle of action and reaction, be affected by mass. With these extraordinary possibilities, the 39-year-old Riemann wrestled in the summer of 1866, even as he lay dying of tuberculosis at Salaska on Lake Maggiore. He came astonishingly close to a geometric theory of gravity half a century before Einstein, who later remarked of Riemann's contribution. Einstein remarked, Physicists were still far removed from such a way of thinking. Space was still for them a rigid, homogeneous something, susceptible of no change or conditions. Only the genius of Riemann, solitary and uncomprehended, had already won its way by the middle of the last century to a new conception of space, in which space was deprived of its rigidity and in which its power to take part in physical events was recognized as possible. One major obstacle had blocked Riemann's further progress. He thought only of space and its topography. Einstein's great epiphany was that in building a new theory of gravity, he also had to deal with time, with space-time and space-time curvature. But to begin with, he didn't have the mathematical tools to do this. They existed. Einstein simply didn't know about them. 